great job and chairing the afternoon sessions and keeping to time, unlike me this morning. Um, so we're up to our uh, final talk of the day, and this is really a, a very exciting um, moment because we've got a you know, true superstar in the academic IR world that we've been really fortunate to um, you know, have on the call today. So it's a great honor to invite Professor Avnesh Thakur, who is a physician scientist at Stanford University um, in the US, where he runs a translational lab in interventional radiology um, and in interventional regenerative medicine. And he practices as a consultant interventional radiologist. Now, um, Professor Thakur did his training in IR, training in um, University of Cambridge in the UK before he went to Canada and completed a number of fellowships in adult and pediatric IR. He then moved to Stanford after that and now undertakes his practice within pediatric intervention and he holds doctorates in cardiovascular physiology and molecular imaging. Uh, and his lab is currently focused on stem cell biology, some novel strategies for precision deliveries of uh, minimally invasive therapies and also tissue engineering. He's uh, NIH funded, has over 100 papers and 14 patents. So Professor Thakur, I know you, you're up very early and you've already given an international lecture already. This is the second one of the day, but we are very, very grateful to have you and thank you for joining us. Over to you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Um, yeah, it's interesting that the world of Zoom allows you to kind of move across the, the world pretty efficiently these days. So we are in Rome and now in London be back in California and within the hour. So faster than an airplane. Um, so let me start by sharing my screen and let me make, make sure you guys can all see it. So. Give me a second. Can everyone see that? Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for all of you for allowing me to speak today. Um, and so Jim really asked me to talk to you about my journey as a kind of a physician scientist. And whilst it's really like relatively easy to show all the cool things, I, I don't think a lot of people really talk about the struggles um, that that you can you have to go through as a physician scientist. And so what I want to do is spend a good portion of this talk talking to you about these struggles. Um, and then also the one, how you can overcome them in order that you can achieve success. So let's start with that. So when we, when we look at research and we define it, it's defined as a detailed study of a subject in order to discover information or to achieve a new understanding of it. Draw everyone's attention to the word detailed. So when we look at the word details, in order to do something in detail, you have to keep on trying over and over again in order to achieve success. So you have to actually dive deep into your subject. And this essentially is what research is all about, right? So if you look at the word research, there's an RE in front of the word search, right? So it means that you have to keep on searching over and over again in order to find the answer, okay? And that just takes time, right? And so there are no shortcuts to this. And it requires you to really have a very good work ethic and just to be tenacious um, and not give up. So when a lot of you will start your research careers, at the beginning, you'll feel rather lost. There'll be a lot of paths ahead of you and not all of them actually be in a straight line where you can see a vision going forward. But if you stick with it, Opportunities emerge, but also your path will emerge. So essentially, it's a journey. It's a long journey, um, but you just have to trust the process um, and rely on it actually guiding you in the right way. I'm going to talk a little bit about my past, the current, present, where I am, and where I see the future. But I'm going to do it with a slant of telling you the lessons that I've learned the lessons that I'm currently learning, and then how I'm preparing myself for the future at my current stage of the career. And hopefully this adds value to a lot of you out there in terms of being able to kind of navigate your research pathways. So let's start with the past, okay? So when I break down your current algorithm there in the UK, it kind of looks like this to my best understanding. So you have your medical school, your foundation years, your registrar, 
your higher fellowships and then your ability to be a consultant. And I mapped my research career onto this um, and I actually kind of broke it down into two different areas. So I did areas of focused research where I got degrees and then I had opportunistic research where there wasn't enough time during my clinical training where I then sought out different research opportunities, albeit sporadic and opportunistic. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to go through this, but it gave me an idea and it really highlighted one thing which I wanted to get across to you, which was as you move through this spectrum, your ability to do any focus and consolidated research actually starts to decrease. And so that's really important because I want everyone who is in any one of these phases to realize that if you think that you're going to get more time in the next phase is actually wrong. <laughs> The, probably the best time is right now, um, and we'll go on to kind of optimizing how that is. So again, when we break down your career, it's really broken down into pre and post consultancy, okay? So in the pre-consultant era, I really want you to think about it as a learning opportunity, right? Or an apprenticeship in research. Because once you become a consultant, essentially you're independent. It's incredibly difficult to really start to forge something at that particular point in time. So the idea is that earlier on in your career, it's really the time for you all to try different things and explore different areas which you think you can be interested in. Because as I said, once you hit that independence marker, once you get that consultant, which everyone's in a rush to get to, but the unfortunate thing is once you hit that, you need to have complete clarity in terms of where you're going and what you to do. And so the idea is that during your training pathway is to try and figure that out. So when we look at the opportunities, it's really important to understand that you don't necessarily have to pick the final topic of your interest. As I said, you can explore different areas, but it's really important to be taught. So you need to be in an environment and have mentors around you who are going to teach you things. And essentially, what you really need to be doing is you need to be learning how to design experiments, conduct experiments, that's both wet and dry lab, how to process a lot of information in a clear way, how to analyze that data, how to write about it, how to present it, and essentially how to time manage and multitask. And it's so interesting when I look back that all the skill set actually stood me in such good stead in my clinical practice. Um, and so this idea that many people have of having to do a PhD in the field in order to progress in the field is actually, I want you guys to flip it around. I want you to look at it more as a learning and a training opportunity at each of the particular points or any research thing that you do. Because as I said, once you hit the consultant, you're on your own. Right? No one's going to help teach you. No one's going to help you do anything. And you're kind of expected to know what to do. Um, and so you would never be asked to become an interventional radio radiology consultant on day one because you've not been trained, right? So the same thing with research. So it's important to set your mindset in the right way for that. And so don't worry about taking time out. So that's another really big thing I see with um, the younger kind of population as they come through. They're such in a rush to get to that consultant um, post that they don't have the opportunity or they're very kind of reluctant to take one, two, three years out to do any research, but then they want to do research when they're a consultant, but they've got no grounding to actually kind of go off. So take the opportunities when it comes. Okay. So go out and find them and then think outside the box. Something will always have to give when an opportunity you have to either give up time, essentially rearrange your clinical training. Um, but it's very important to do that and to be flexible with that. Another major thing is really take advantage of your current training situation. As I said, the consultant thing is you're independent, but at each of the other kind of um, set points, if you take time out, you have contract for somebody to train you to finish your F1, F2, or your registrar or your fellowship. So you have a protected umbrella. And so it's very important to take advantage and to leverage that. And finally, don't become institutionalized, right? Go and travel, right? Go and see different places. That's important academically and non-academically as well. 
you know, really go out there, go and find new places, go and learn new techniques, go and be exposed to new things. But the main thing that I would, I would ask all of you is go and find good mentors, right? Both clinically and academically. And the only way you find good mentors is by asking, right? Asking people different things and then ultimately trying to align yourself to finding a mentor. Because, you know, I will promise to you that there will be a massive list of people throughout your training, if you're serious about this, who will tell you that they, you cannot do this, uh, you will not be good at this, um, you don't have time to do this, um, you're not going to be good at X or Y if you're trying to do this. Um, and trust me, I had a whole list of them, a whole list of people who just kept on saying it's just, you're never going to be able to do it, you're never going to be able to balance everything. Um, if you do this, then you can't do this. And, you know, it was, it was, it's quite disheartening. But for every one of those, I had my list of people who supported me and who guided me during my training. First of all, family. And then I have about a, six people who I can categorically say were the people who changed my career trajectory. And I mean, not to listen to the list, the list on my left and to help me guide me on the list on my right. So go and find your mentors. And when you find it's really important to find somebody who will empower you to succeed. Somebody who's going to stand by you and in the dark times when things are really tough, um, you know, either in your clinical aspects when you're trying to balance everything or in the research aspect when none of your experiments go well, and they'll pull you through because they will have the vision for you and they will have a vision of your project and they will be able to pull you through those and guide you so you can reach your full potential. So super important. But like with any relationship, what you get out is what you put in. Okay. So it's a two way street. So let's kind of really get to the kind of the, the, the brass tacks out of all of it. You know, when you do research, ultimately you need to have something to show because you're going to have to leverage that in the future, right? So the main thing is you've got to get publications, right? So, you know, I understand that research is trying to pursue something and you can't guarantee whether it's going to work or it doesn't work. But the quality of your research is often governed by the, the, your publication, both in its impact factor and your authorship position. And you're going to have to leverage that later on to build your research career. So it's important that you are focused and you're on projects which you see a vision or a goal that's going to reach an endpoint which you can potentially write up. The other things that are very important when you're doing your research stints is to understand that you can actually get degrees or awards and that you're going to build up a network of collaborations and connections. And these will all be feathers in your cap and you'll be able to then leverage these feathers at different points in your career trajectory. But you have to put the feathers there first, okay? And that just takes time. And sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't work. But when it doesn't work, what I want to keep on iterating is you can just keep on going um, and it's okay to fail, okay? So I really want everyone to kind of change their mindsets um, regarding failure because it's important because failure actually tells you what not to do, both in an experiment or with a particular approach that you're having to your life. And it forces you to iterate. And it, only through the iteration process will you then be able to find success. And if you guys haven't failed yet, you really then haven't taken enough chances or really challenged yourself outside your comfort zone. Because failure is a definitive part of you being successful as a physician scientist. So lessons that I learned when I became a consultant over the last, you know, however many years I've been practicing now. The first thing is know the game you're playing, okay? It's so important. It's important to understand that both in terms of what is your job eventually and where are you working? And we'll go into what is your job in a minute, um, but it's so important to know where you're working, doing within your job because every game has a different rule set. And so what I want you to challenge you to do is to start to think of yourselves 20 years from now, project yourself into the future. Do you want to be doing high-end interventional cases? Do you want to be running a research laboratory doing basic science or translational science? Do you want to be running clinical trials? Do you want to be an in industry? Whatever it is, project yourself and then work backwards 
to identify milestones that you can then put your flag on at years 5, 10, and 15. And then that will set the direction that you should be aiming for. It's important because when you finally become a consultant, you're going to have to ask yourself this question, especially as a physician scientist or as an academic person, is what really is your job? And what you can actually only do one thing well. And it's really counterintuitive because you come out, let's say, of fellowships or residency or um, registrar years in, in, in the UK, and you've done research and you think you can do everything. At that point, you actually think you're bulletproof. Um, and you have to be prepared to give up several of these things to focus on one thing and to do that one thing well. And so a lot of you will be in this spectrum, you know, between clinical and academia. And in the clinical side, some of you may be doing diagnostic radiology, adult intervention, peds intervention. Some of you may be in basic sciences, um, wet lab, you know, or dry in, you know, computational sciences, translational sciences, clinical trials, or even teaching. You can't do it all. It's especially important to know that as you're emerging into your consultant years, right, that you have to only pick one thing and focus on that. And so for me, it was, it, it was hard because when I first came out, I thought I could do everything. I had a bit of wet lab experience, a bit of dry lab and a bit of clinical trials. I was doing adult intervention and peds intervention. And I was realizing I was getting nowhere fast. Um, and so I started to kind of think is that where am I on the spectrum? Am I more on the clinical side of the spectrum or am I more on the research side of the spectrum? And then if I was and wherever I was, I then started to figure out, well, what did I need to do to make sure that that end of the spectrum, I was going to be successful. And so for me, I gravitated more towards the academic side of the spectrum. And so I started to give up a lot of my practice. I gave up all my practice. I concentrated on pediatric practice. I gave up all of the hardcore molecular science, and I really focused on translational science, and I didn't do any of the clinical trials. Now, six, seven, eight years, um, I then started, once I got all my infrastructure set up, started to then integrate back in other practices that I had. At the beginning, you have to give it all up, and you have to focus on what you're most passionate about. The next thing to really think about is where are you working? It's important to find an environment where you can grow, innovate, and evolve, both either academically, if you're that way inclined, or clinically, if you're that way inclined. And we can see this in the world around us, okay? Now, here are some pictures of the extremely diverse set of animals, right? But they all come from one region, and they come from the Galapagos Islands. And it's said that in two generations, a new species is generated in the Galapagos Islands. And that's because of the environment, right? The environment is set up to encourage diversity and evolution. And I want you to think about that because if you don't put yourself in the correct environment, you won't be able to evolve and grow. So that's what I mean by coming back to understanding the rules of the game. If you're not in a large academic hospital with a lot of wet lab support, then it's going to be really hard for you to do wet lab translational research. Alternatively, if you're in an environment that doesn't have a very good clinical infrastructure and you're wanting to pioneer new techniques and new treatment options, it's going to be really hard for you to do that. So you've got to try and find an environment which will nurture where you want to actually be. It all comes through degrees of failure. And if I look back at my story, you guys can all see the badge in the bottom hand corner saying Stanford, and it sounds amazing. When I first started, this was my interventional room. So I did four fellowships, you know, throughout the world at really high end institutions. You know, my last institute had eight IR rooms, and this was the room they gave me when I first started, right? It had a mobile CR, and that was it. <laughs> and that was my IR room. And so you can imagine when I came out of fellowship thinking I can do everything and then not being able to do half the things because I essentially there wasn't any practice at Stanford in IR and Pete's IR, it's quite disconcerting, right? Here are some of the comments I got back when I started to write my first grants, right? So this is me already trained, already with you know, 50, 60 papers. And the comments that would come back said, it's not published. You know, it's not discussed, which means the grant was so badly written, they didn't even bother going to the discussion panel. Um, 
look at the numbers on, on the side. You need to be in the ones. My approach got nine, which was basically saying that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And so it's, you know, you can look at all of this and you can imagine in my first couple of years out of practice, it's like, well, I think I'm a failure, right? But over time, as long as you stick with it, you eventually will see the fruit of everything. So this is now my IR room when they said, well, we'll build you one, right? So now we have one of the biggest, largest IR rooms in the entire of the United States, which is completely state of the art with all the new equipment that we have, building three more new rooms as a result of that. You know, over time, my grants have all now been funded. I mean, my lab has now brought in over six and a half million dollars. And we have a huge, um, you know, inventory of publications, postdocs, scientists and everything working in my lab. And so it's really important to understand that it just takes time. OK, but you can't give up. And the other thing is build your team. Right. So this is now my IRT, you know, over 25, 30 people full of technology and nurses. And we all go out and we all have a good time. And this is my lab, right? You know, where we have, and this is actually some of my lab. I've got a few more members that are even on the photograph, but, you know, who all work together in a cohesive team to help us accomplish certain goals. So really important to start to build yourself an infrastructure and a network and a team. So now kind of, you know, more of the going away from the advice and trying to just bring you into kind of the current situation I'm going to show you a couple of slides on the research that I currently do that I find innovative and then where I'm going in the future um, or where I see IR going. So I look at as kind of toggling three main areas. Optimization. And I try to bridge those between um, disease um, and health. And for the disease, I look at diabetes, I look at transplantation, kidney injury, inflammatory bowel disease, ARDS and Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you look at my profile, you would realize that why am I in a regenerative medicine space when my previous research is all in oncology? And so again, it's looking at your environment, right? When I came to Stanford, there was a huge oncology presence here. And I realized that it would be very difficult for me to actually make any inroads of trying to change things. So I pivoted away. I used my training in research and pivoted away into regenerative medicine. And so I had to reestablish myself, but I had the skill sets that I had acquired in that learning apprenticeship phase of my training. So I got very fascinated with the ability of cellular therapies as opposed to drug therapies. Now, drug therapies, they're very standardized, um, um, but their responses will be very dependent on the pharmacogenomics of an individual, where cellular therapies are able to actually modulate their responses based on the environment in which they get placed into. So this has a huge potential in my mind to treat a multiple uh, plethora sorry, of diseases at multiple different angles. And so as an interventional radiologist, where we do treat multiple diseases, this is very appealing for me. So one of the cells which I'm very interested in are mesenchymal stem cells. So unlike other stem cells, which actually differentiate into an organ, so those are like the iPSC-derived type of stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells are a regenerative cell which actually go into tissue environments and orchestrate tissue repair. So they're almost like a, a policeman going into an area and then conducting how to regenerate and how to stop inflammation and how to promote angiogenesis. So I got very interested in that because it's got a wide range of applicability across multiple diseases. Types of mesenchymal stem cells, we profile them at a very high level, both at a genomic and at a proteinomic level. We start to understand how they work, as I said, by halting different diseases, and we look at how they actually do that through their cytokines. We look at a and how they restore the bioenergetic health, which means how healthy a, a, a cell can actually, how healthy um, a cell is um, in terms of its mitochondrial load and its ability to produce ATP. And we look at how mesenchymal stem cells can actually transfer the mitochondria into these injured cells to help rescue them. And then we look at their ability to release these little vesicles called extracellular vesicles which actually carry um, microRNA as well as mitochondria, but more so the mitochondria the, okay, because it reprograms the tissue environment. 
So we look at those in various disease models. Um, we look at them, as I said, in, you know, in, in the pancreas, in the kidney, and in the lung. We show that they have great therapeutic effects. Um, and we, then we try and modulate and upregulate how these cells actually function. We then take the advantages that interventional radiology affords, which is the ability to actually localize um, therapy to certain areas in a very efficient way. And if we think about cell therapies, most cell therapies are given intravenously. And the problem with that is that they're then trapped in the lungs because of their size. So very small amounts of therapy actually reach their target locations. So if we think about it as interventional radiologists, we can circumvent that. So we can ensure that we can get cell therapies directly into injured organs because of the system either through their blood supply or percutaneously through the skin. So the next kind of portion of my lab really then works on trying to understand and how to deliver therapies locally so we can maximize that therapeutic effect. And here's some examples of delivering it directly into the pancreas in small animal models, and therefore really amplifying their effect in being able to, in this case, you know, mitigate diabetes for the pancreas. We look at it in the kidney, and we show its ability to mitigate acute kidney injury because the cells can actually reach the kidney, whereas they can't do that when they're given intravenously because they end up in the lungs. Then we actually do a lot of bioengineering in the lab. And so we look at abilities to kind of co-house these stem cells with our target cells. So we build what's called bioscaffolds, which have three-dimensional structures um, that allow us to nest cell therapies inside. And then we can implant these bioscaffolds into animals which have diseases and allow the cell therapies to basically kick into it. So here are publications we have with islets, um, given that, you know, that they can actually produce insulin to mitigate any glycemic excursions in diabetic patients. We're able to release micro platforms, which can release drug therapies and again be locally delivered at specific sites. We have nanoparticle platforms that can actually elute um, therapies as well, which we titrate according to a time scale that makes it conducive for a cell to reestablish its own microenvironments. And then we actually build hybrid catheters, um, for example, that we can then place into patients, which can actually co-harvest cellular therapies. The last thing we do is optimization. And so we actually use focused ultrasound, which is unlike diagnostic ultrasound, where the beam diverges, in focused ultrasound, the beam converges. And what we found very interestingly is that the convergence of the beam actually causes mechanical agitation of the tissue. And that induces an environment which actually promotes tissue healing, tissue regeneration, cell and cell honing. And so we're now looking at modulating microenvironments so we can combine that with the stem cells and our local regional delivery approaches in order to maximize the therapeutic effects. So where is it going to go in the future? So in the future, the way I see it now is that I'm going to start to now bridge a lot of my wet science, which is still ongoing, into the clinical domain. And so what I'm doing here at Stanford is actually building clinical translational pathways out of the lab into patients. And so I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to basically discuss three areas where we're actually moving to here now on the clinical side. And again, remember that I can only build the clinical side many, many years after I've established the basic science side and the translational side in the lab. Right? So you have to build a pathway up slowly. And so here is an example of some of the delivery routes that I'm now starting to do, not with the cell therapies, but I'm starting to build the workflows of pharmacological therapies because they're just slightly more easier. So here is an example of endovascular delivery of high-dose steroids that I do in the liver or the bowel for patients who have got either inflammatory bowel disease or graft versus host disease. The same thing with the kidney. And now we're starting to you know, move into the lymphatics, for example, from a delivery perspective. So that's going to have some kind of interesting kind of slants for immunotherapy um, modulation. We also can percutaneously access organs. So that's including the CSF or the solid organs or even the endoluminal. Here's an example of a, um, the biliary system where we can deliver therapy directly to the biliary system. But it's these delivery we have and we control as interventional radiologists which allow us to then open up the possibilities for drugs, cells, and genes where all of these things have failed in the past because they can't localize at the right tissue concentrations at the right size. 
We're also doing a lot now with multimodal imaging. So that's the fusion of imaging um, in terms of localizing areas for precision sampling. And now we're starting to move more into the augmented reality setting in order that we can actually push that we have in our imaging into more conducive ways so we can actually access them during the operation itself. And so this is an example, for example, of a multimodal fusion imaging on a pediatric patient on a bone lesion, which could only be seen on MR and not on fluoroscopy. But we can fuse them. The other one is a co-localization of a lung nodule, which the surgeons can then go down on a wire localization to actually do a wedge resection as well. And finally, we need to actually look at customizable platforms. And this is where I think the future, especially for pediatrics, will be because we're able to actually 3D print either models, which will help us map how to actually deliver therapies, especially in the more complex scenarios where patients and children have had previous surgeries that have altered the anatomy, but also to actually 3D print devices. So they can include catheters and needles that we can actually custom build to ensure the success of our therapy. End on is, I think, one of the most innovative areas, I think, in interventional radiology is actually pediatric IR. And that's kind of the reason why I transitioned to pediatric away from adult IR. And um, now a lot of you will think pediatric IR is mainly about just, you know, you know, lines and biopsies. And yes, a lot of my practice is about lines and biopsies, but I'm going to show you some cases that I've just done in the last, I think, four or five months, which will actually show you the other breadth of pediatric IR, why I think it's so interesting. So this is an example of a cryoablation that I did on a 10-year-old, um, which I was able to actually reduce the size of the tumor before it impinged on the brachial plexus of a child. Here's an example of endovascular tumor retrieval. This was a 16-year-old boy who came with a tumor that extended from the left testis all the way up the renal vein, across the renal vein, all the way up the IVC, through the heart, and into the lungs. And so this was done with cardiothoracic surgery. They did the open surgical removal through a thoracotomy, and I did the IVC and the renal vein removal using the different devices that we had there. Here's an example of a two-year-old who had a um, liver transplant and had a biliary stricture. And what I was able to do is reconstruct the biliary stricture and actually place endoscopic stents through percutaneous access. You can see a double bowel stent there. And that saved that two-year-old from being retransplanted and actually their liver enzymes have now normalized as a result of that. Here's a renal trauma I did two weeks ago on a, on a 16 year old with a road traffic accident where you can see that that's the kidney completely split in half um, as a result of the trauma that they sustained um, onto their right flank. This is an example of a one year old who's got actually a stone which I got access and will subsequently do a PCNL on them in the next two weeks now that the access site is um, maturing and we can then insert our scope. So you can see here that there's a lot of breadth of innovation that can be done clinically in pediatric IR, and it makes it very challenging with the small kids, but actually really interesting as well. So that's really what I have to say, and I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. Well, um, thank you for that uh, for that talk, um, Professor Thacker. That was. Um, um, well, if you're not if you're not inspired to do research or inter, uh, pediatric intervention, I don't know what else is going to do that for you. Um, thank you for sharing your journey and uh, the introspective journey that you, you know, going from nothing to where you are. You often think that just these big American institutions just give you funding and give you resources, but actually showing that you have to actually do a lot of work and get rejected a few times, maybe more than a few times to get there is, you know, quite quite important for people to know. And um, just want to um, open the floor up to any questions, if we have any. Uh, I just had one question. Thank you so much for that talk. I think it was really good to see all the, the things that you were doing, actually. Um, it, I just wanted to ask about translational research in IR, and specifically in the UK, because there's a lot of it, or at least from what we can see, there's a lot going on in the US. Um, but it seems like the UK is behind a little bit. Um, what barriers do you think there are or are there any lessons we can learn from how things are done in the US in terms of having more translational research over here within interventional radiology? I think it's the opposite. So, you know, I think that the ability for, for you to innovate in the UK is, is far easier than the US, ironically. Now, you can only have to look at aortic stent grafting to know that. 
you know, a lot of the aortic innovation has been done in the UK, Europe, and Australia, and less so in the US. Uh, especially when I, I grew up when, you know, we were, you know, aortic stents were just coming out. So I kind of saw that. Um, and it's because the FDA regulates everything so, so much here in the US. What you have in the US is every institution is an independent private entity. And so there's often a lot of competition, whereas when everyone in the in the UK is really, you know, governed by the NHS, and I think there's much more of a collegial and open cross-culture around so as long as you guys aren't really fixated on owning something at a particular place, but partnering with a group and again, a team of colleagues that you will build up over your career, and that you can think even surpass a lot of you know, the US and uh, European institutions by the ability of, of just communicating and building a team network for a particular disease approach or an area of interest that you have from a translational perspective. Brilliant. Um, I was I was actually interested to hear um, you would encourage people to move around and move to different countries. I know you have. Um, from your own personal experience, what have the what has actually moving to different countries really taught you, um, and how has it benefited your research? It taught me um, that unfortunately I, I never really had a home. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, and so that was that was tough, right? You know, I had my kids during the move, um, which was which was difficult. Um, I essentially lived out of five suitcases. Um, that kind of suitcases, but I think that the ability to see see it's it's very interesting. You know, I grew up in a culture where you were with consultants who used one catheter and one needle. And if you used any other catheter, it was frowned upon. And if you suggested anything else, it was like, well, what are you doing? That's not the way to do it. And it's, um, it was such a breath of fresh air to go out and see different buyers that I'd never even knew the name of. Now a standard of practice. So, you know, and again, the same thing goes with research. So it's really important not to become institutionalized because you may not use the different techniques that you're being exposed to every day but i can promise you that given enough years on the block there will be a case where you will go hold on a minute maybe i'll use that catheter because someone else used it somewhere along the line so it's that exposure and that a level of kind of working with different people in different ways to realize that there's no one way to do something i showed you a pathway for me personally that may not be the right pathway for you or for someone else Um, but it's important to know that there are other things out there. That's brilliant. And we've got one question from the floor. Um, Hanane Shuani said, asked, um, as a physician scientist, how much of your time do you spend writing grants or chasing funding? 100%. Right. <laughs> uh, so when I first started off my lab, you know, it was hard because... I had, you have to define yourself and that's what it is. You know, it's interesting, you know, when I remember I, um, when I got my kind of my job, my position, they gave me an office, right? And they gave me lab, lab benches. And it's, it's really interesting. It was, there was nothing there. There was not one pipette. There was, there was just, you know, a, a, a desk with, with a lamp. And it's like, well, you know, good luck. You have five years to prove yourself. Otherwise you don't get reappointed. And so a lot of, I remember for the first eight months, I never stepped foot out of my office. No, not even to the lab bench upstairs, which just left completely blank. It's red. And I just read, this was in my academic time, obviously I was doing clinical time at the same time, right? So in the academic time, I was just reading, 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 reading. I was encouraged to do that by my, my mentor and just said, just read and understand. And then when I read and understood everything and I finally had a vision of where I wanted to do, then I did my first hire. And then I was able to guide them on what to do. Very little time at the bench side by then, but more in terms of reading and guiding and then writing. And now, you know, now we have 11 people in the lab. I still write all the grants. Now they help me, okay? So, but I don't do any wet lab based. I'm not on the bench at all now. Um, because that's not a good use of your time. So you build a team 
with the right number of people who can do the right things. Now, these guys are phenomenal scientists, right? If you ask me to do a progenomic analysis of their sample, I'll be not sure what to do, okay? But do I know what the implications of doing that analysis is and how it's going to be applied? Yes, I know what to do with that. So I can assimilate that information and portray it in a grant with their help. So again, build the team. So all my time now is just chasing funding because I have to pay for everyone's salary. So that's how it works here in the US. So every single person in my lab will be, you know, X, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. Now, if I don't bring that money in, I have to let them go. So not only do I need to bring the money in to support their salary, but I also need to bring the money in to support the consumables or the animals or the reagents or the equipment. So you realize that, hold on, it's actually, you know, at every single time you kind of always fighting the curve, which is, do you have more money in the bank and allow them to have a longer runway? Or do you hire more people with the vision that you'll find more data, which can then help you get more money and get the finance that you'll learn over time in terms of what to do? So sometimes you see these huge labs full of 20, 30 people. Now, if each person costs $100,000, that's about you know, X number of million every year you need to bring in to pay for everyone. Okay. So it's, you know, it's very interesting to think about how you build a lab where you're responsible for everyone in that lab at the end of it. So that's hard when you're then saying you're trying to do all of that. And then your email is blowing up with all the clinical referrals that are coming through and saying, well, can you come and treat this patient and do this and do this? It's like, you know, where do you go? Um, but you need to have that training in the background to understand how to manage all those different things congruently. Yeah, I, I was interested to hear about you able to use the skills that you'd acquired in research to pivot. That's quite an interesting position so that whenever a trainees are potentially doing research, it's not time that you're wasting because you're basically working out your research skills, aren't you? And um, developing. I mean, I, I still remember I did my PhD before I became a houseman back in those so before f1 um and ultimately you know having i remember you know back in the my days when there was wasn't any of this european working time kind of constraints you know you were on for like three four days on the on the trot and you had 40 50 people and your trust said see you later your consultant said don't even dare call me the registrar kind of said don't even dare call me and your researcher was like well i might want to be called or i might not but here's the list and on you go right and it's like, you know, you just reflect back, well, how do you time manage? How do you prioritize the sick from the non-sick? How do you know when to, you know, go and write all your fluids up, right? You know, what particular point? And it's interesting, just having all those different skill sets, it actually became a lot more easier to practice clinically based on all of the information that you've gathered during your PhD training, right? Again, assimilating complex data sets, you know, looking at, you know, doing everything, you can make lots of analogies. You can do that both in your clinical patients. You can do it in your investment portfolio, you know, looking at all your different investments and how to actually strategize which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, how to optimize your portfolio through diversity. It's all through research. I do lots of diversity on my disease spectrum, right, in terms of what I'm doing, but they're designed in a way that not all my eggs are in one basket. So if that research funding fails, the other ones can kick in and kind of support the other ones so they can re-succeed. I'm sure you guys all do that with your investments, right? You have, you have stocks, you have shares, you have bonds. You know, you should be diversifying your portfolio and you will be, at, you will be in a position to do that because one day you're going to have to kind of draw on the different things, either for having a mortgage for yourself or sending your kids to school or sending your kids to university. So you're going to have to draw on that, but you're going to have to build that that's, um, that's fascinating. Thank, thank you for um, sharing your insights. And I think we could probably listen to you all day, but we do have to draw the meeting to a close, unfortunately. So um, thank you for your time. Um, I've got a few uh, things to end on here.